the wine of Babylon. So let's have a look at why the system is called Babylon and what is the prominent role that the beast power, which we have sadly identified as the papacy, plays in this Babylonian trinity. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, where unto you do well to take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place. Until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. 2 Peter 1.19 We have to diligently study the prophecies. We have to know what's going on behind the scenes. We have to know why and wherefore God says things. Jeremiah 51, 6 and 7, speaking about literal Babylon, says, Flee out of the midst of Babylon and deliver every man his soul. Now the type, literal Babylon, is our lesson book to tell us why God calls the end time confederacy also Babylon. Be not cut off in her iniquity. For this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He will render unto her a recompense. So this system is a deceiving system. It has a false religion and leads people to perdition. Babylon has been a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken her wine, therefore the nations are mad. In other words, the nations that drink the wine of Babylon, they go crazy. Wine in the Bible, now if Jesus is the vine, then the wine that comes forth from the vine must be what he says, must be his fruit, must be the doctrines. So Babylon has false doctrines. Now we're not going to deal with all the false doctrines tonight, we're going to look at why the Bible defines the system as Babylon. And we're going to go to ancient Babylon in order to do that. That is why it is called Babel, because the Lord confused the language of the whole world. Genesis 11, 7 to 9. This has been a thorn in the devil's side ever since that time. When they were building the Tower of Babel in order to unite in apostasy towards God because God had said he will never destroy the world by a flood again they still built a tower in case he tried something like that in the future so God separated the nations and that is something that was essential for our salvation because by separating the nations this constant tension on this planet would lead people to seek God because if you are threatened by one or the other, you seek God. And God can stay in the minds of men. The devil doesn't like the separation. And he wants one unitary system whereby all will worship him. And there followed another angel saying, this is now the book Revelation, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, Revelation 14.8. So in other words, here you have a system that is selling wine that is full of fornication. That is apostasy towards God. Now if you are apostatizing towards God, who are you serving? The other one. The other one. And he also has a garb. He also has a garb. He presents himself either in this form or in that form, or whatever form he wants to present himself. But whatever form it is, it's not God's way, it's His way. So here is a false system that has been set up. Now Revelation 16, 19 tells us, and the great city, referring to spiritual Babylon, it cannot be ancient Babylon because God said ancient Babylon would never be rebuilt. So that serves as a type. And a type, by definition, is always smaller than the antitype. The Lamb stands for Jesus Christ. So the Lamb is just a small example of the greater, more prominent antitype, which is Christ Himself. Babylon, 
the type stands for those who would apostatize against God and in a larger, on a larger scale at the end of time it represents all those who in confederacy work together to oppose God. Jerusalem served as a type as all of those who would seek God and seek salvation through the Lamb. So that's typology. So here we have this great city was divided into three parts. So now we know Babylon has three components. And we're going to deal with all three of them in this lecture series. Don't miss any of this. And the cities of the nations fell and all the great Babylon came into the remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. So if you stay in Babylon, then you're going to have to deal with this side of the issue. God will recompense. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs. This is heavy. The spirit that actuates Babylon consists of unclean spirits. And they came out of the mouth of the dragon. That's Satan himself because the Bible defines the dragon as Satan in Revelation chapter 12. And out of the mouth of the beast, Revelation tells us about the beast, and we've already dealt with it in great detail, the little horn power of Daniel chapter 7 and the beast out of the sea, Revelation chapter 13 and we sadly had to identify it as the papacy and out of the mouth of the false prophet. You know in the other languages this comes out a little bit better. If you take it in the German then it is Rachen des Drachens, Rachen des Tieres, Mund des falschen Propheten if you know what that means. There's a harsher word and a softer word for the word mouth. And the dragon and the beast get the harsh, harsher word and the false prophet gets the sadder mouth. Now the false prophet are all those who once had the truth but return back to the mother system. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, and we looked at miracles last night, and these miracles will deceive people which go forth unto the kings of the earth, that's the political systems of the world, of how much of the world? The whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. So the conflict is going to be between this false trinity and the people of God. Those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. So mystic Babylon consists of the dragon component, the dragon, Satan, working directly with man. That would be spiritism, strange occurrences, appearances, uh, all of those spiritualistic activities. The beast, organized religion, culminating in the papacy, and the false prophet, those who once knew, but are returning to false prophecies. We are told by Eusebius that Constantine, in order to recommend the new religion to the heathen, transferred into it the outward ornaments to which they had been accustomed in their own development of Christian doctrine. And the evidence points out the fact that Christianity early on was paganized and just took on the garb of Christianity. And this is derived according to the writings of the secret societies. It can be traced all the way back to Simon Magus. Simon Magus followed Peter and Paul to Rome and he was a magician. He was a pagan priest who put on a cloak of Christianity because he wanted to have that power and Peter rebuked him. And this Simon Magus, by the way the name Simon also means Peter, he followed them to Rome and this occult mixture between paganism and Christianity finds its seat in him. He was the Petra, P-T-R. And the Petra, Peters, have nothing to do with Simon Peter the Apostle, but have to do with Simon Magus. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in amongst you and will not spare the flock. 
even from your own number men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. The teachings of Magus, of Simon Magus, having come from Sumeria, were Kabbalistic in nature. And out of Kabbalism comes Gnosticism. And Gnosticism is the teaching that the Messiah is the Osiris of old. So the ancient Egyptian mythologies, which come from the Book of the Dead, which come from Tutmosis III, who was the very pharaoh who clashed with Moses, who was the high priest of occultism and paganism. This religion of Osiris and Isis, the goddess, this, how shall we say this, anthropomorphic human input into this religion, and androgenic worship, because the deities were both male and female, and they were interchangeable. This religion is what was brought into Christianity. Now the ancient gods, if we want to find the thread into modern Babylon, we'll have to look at ancient Babylon. The Chaldeans worshipped Bel, or Merodach, and then there was Ninus the sun. And the sun was also worshipped as Tammuz. And the women of Israel were very apt to weep for Tammuz because he was an artificial, a counterfeit Messiah. The devil had the Messiah prepared before the real one so that people would not accept the real one. How do we know Jesus is the real one? Do you remember the prophecy we dealt with? Do you remember the prophecy on the Messiah? The 70 week pr prophecy? Where the rabbinic curse says that you are cursed, your hand, your, your finger, your wrist, your arm, that you are cursed if you should number the 70 weeks because it identifies the real Messiah spot on. So the counterfeit Messiah was already there and he was Tammuz. Then there was the goddess, Rhea. She was also worshipped as Ishtar, from which we have the word Easter today, Astarte, Beltus, and she was the queen of heaven. She was the queen of heaven. And she was known as the wrath subduer. Now, in Catholicism we have exactly the same thing. It is stated, nobody comes to the Father except through Jesus, but nobody comes to Jesus except through Mary. And Mary is the mediatrix. She is the wrath subduer. So we have a similar system to what we had here in Babylonian times. Now if you take these religions and you look at them on a worldwide basis, in Egypt these deities were worshipped as Isis, the goddess, and her son Osiris. And Osiris was the one who died, became part of the sun, was resurrected, and came back to this earth as Horus. Horus, the divine child and the Divine Mother, Isis, so you have mother and child worship. In India, they were worshipped as Isi and Iswara. It's the same religion. In fact, the Babylonian religion is today the universal religion of all the religious systems. China, it was Xing Mu and the Holy Mother and Son. In Greece, Ceres and Irene and Plutus. In Rome, it was Fortuna and Jupiter Pure. This was the ancient system of worship. It's interesting that in the latest seminar taking place about Christianity in the world today, the so-called Jesus Seminar, where they are speaking about a new reformation. God forbid that we should call it a reformation. Amen. Where they talk about a reformation and want to put Jesus on a par with Osiris. I have a problem with that. Because the one is a counterfeit of the other. And the religious doctrines associated with the Book of the Dead, which concerns Osiris, is totally the opposite of what the Bible says. Well, Ezekiel 8.16 says, At the door of the temple of the Lord between the porch and the altar were about five and twenty men, with their backs towards the temple of the Lord and their faces towards the east, and they worshipped the sun towards the east. So ancient Israel although they knew God and knew the power of God, were already diverted towards this paganism. I'll tell you why. 
because it's a very sophisticated religion. Don't underestimate paganism. We think these peoples were, were silly or stupid because they worship pagan gods. We're no less stupid. Did you know that? Most of my life I served pagan gods. Didn't even know it. Didn't even know it. But that's a fact. So, they worship the sun because sun worship is a perfect counterfeit of messianic worship. So in other words, it's easy to substitute the one for the other, put him in the right garb, and apply the right liturgy, and you've got a religion. Now the religion comes from the legend of Nimrod and Semiramis. Nimrod was a warrior against the Lord, and he was the one who apostatized, and then he was put to death, and his widow, Semiramis, claimed that he had been resurrected or had take, been taken up to the sun and had been reborn through her. And as the fish swims in the waters of the Euphrates, so the fish symbol became the symbol of the God that protected Nimrod in this transition. And then she gave birth to the child, who was, of course, the birth, the rebirth, the resurrection, if you like, in a child of Osiris. In Scandinavia, they were worshipped as Frigga and Balda, Venus and Adonis in Rome, and Ashtoreth and Baal in Phoenicia. And the child became the sin bearer and became the savior. And this was his name. He was called Zoroaster. By the way, Zoroasterism is alive and well and living in the Middle East. It is the seed of the woman, Mitras, the Savior. Mitraism is one of the most sophisticated forms of sun worship. And we will be dealing with Mitraism because it is astounding who Mitra was and what Mitraism is today. Even here in the United States, you'll be surprised how much Mitraism there is. Dionysius is the sin bearer, Bacchus the branch, Vishnu the victim man, Osiris king and kings. Do you recognize those titles? Those are all titles that belong to Jesus Christ. And they have been <coughs> captured by these pagan deities. Now, if you were a priest of the pagan deities, then you worship this deity in many, many forms. One of the most prominent forms was in the form of the god Dagon, and the priests to Dagon, Dag, On, On is the Egyptian for God, Dag is fish, so it's the fish form of this god. The priests wore the fish mitre on the head, and uh, they had a complete fish cloak. And the fish, in ancient Egypt and in pagan religions becomes the symbol of Dagon. In this particular Egyptian one you have the horns of the bull. The bull, the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet was the symbol of the bull. In the, in the east it was the alpha, the elef, the elephant, the elephant becomes the bull of the east and these creatures become symbols of the sun god. Therefore you have bull worship and you have elephant worship, and the horns that were between the eyes of the bull also are a, are a symbol of the half moon, the sickle moon, which becomes a symbol of the womb of the woman which receives the rebirth of the sun god. So later on they became a little bit more sophisticated and the priests of Dagon wore the fish mitre and the cloak and then later on, they substituted the fish cloak for colorful robes. Normally in the colors crimson, which is the color of sacrifice, purple, which is the color of royalty. Now, do you recognize that sort of mitre on the top there? Do people wear it today in another form? Yes, they do. Well, let's go and see if we can find it really in the ancient Babylonian um, Finds, yes we can. This one here comes from the Pergamon Museum. I took this one myself. There you have the symbol of the sun 
And the wavy lines, by the way, wavy lines emanating from the sun are the sign of the female symbol. Straight lines are the sign of the male symbol. Through the union of the male and female deity, you had the birth of the Savior. And uh, here you have priests of Dagon walking around with pails over there containing holy water. And they would have little brushes which were made from hyssop. And then they would sprinkle the people to wash them. Is that a ritual that is practiced today? Yes, very much so. Here you have a priest, a high priest of Dagon. There you had the symbol in the sky of the god Shamash, who is the symbol of the deity. He has the wings, normally the wings of an eagle. And then you have the solar symbol in the middle. There's another solar symbol, which is two stars superimposed over each other, making eight spokes. So you make a solar wheel of eight spokes. And if you were the high priest, then you had to bow down to the high priest, or if you were the representative or the god himself, and you had to often kiss the ring and kiss the slipper. Now if we go to Rome, this is the pantheon outside Rome, and this is the place where all the deities of ancient times were worshipped, and outside you have this little statue over here where you have a cuboid down there, which is also a symbol of paganism, by the way. Then you have the elef standing at the bottom, symbol of the sun god. Then you have the stella, which is the symbol of the phallic symbol of Osiris, because when Isis put him back together again, this is one of the parts she had to reconstruct. And on top of that, you have the symbol of the cross. And we'll deal with that a little bit later. If you go into the Pantheon, you have interesting little things on the floor. You have squares. The pagan deities were either in a square or they were represented in a circle. So you have circles and you have squares. And because they were both good and evil, representing both shades, therefore you had black and white squares. Now if we go to Roman Catholic churches, you will find, and cathedrals, you'll find the fish over there. This is the, the ancient goddess, Astarte. There's the fish mitre, with the symbol of the star or the sun and the half moon over there. And then you have a whole plethora of pagan symbols in the hand, many of which are used today. This one is used by the medical world. That one up there is very interesting. Here's a fish, for example. This comes out of Hinduism as a symbol of the pagan deity. There was the god Osiris, and here you have some interesting symbols on the mitre of the Pope. There you have the symbol of the sun god. That's the, one of the main symbols of the sun deity, with the four and the four spokes within a circle. And that over there is a cross, which is known as the Maltese cross. And the Knights of Malta wear that particular cross. And we will see that that particular cross, look at it carefully, is a direct symbol of the sun deity. It's got nothing to do with Christianity. Well, let's go there. Here is one of the kings of um, ancient times. And this is a, an Assyrian king, Sargon. What has he got around his neck? Can you see it? This is in the British Museum. There you have the Maltese cross, which is the same cross that the Pope has on his side. And he's pointing here with his finger, like this, which is also a symbol of the one, meaning the one deity, the number one, the one stands for the sun god. There you have the symbol which we just saw on the mitre of the Pope, symbol of the sun god. There's another symbol. You have the compass, the set square and the compass, which you find in Freemasonry. Over there you have the half moon with the sickle in it, which you find in many religions. There you have the multi-layered one, as you find in the Aztec religions of sun worship. And there you have the triple mitre, the three aspects of the sun god. Those are the, some of the main symbols of sun worship, as you find them in ancient times. Where do you think we'll find them most prominently today? Probably in the papacy. 
Well, all of these are wearing fish mitres. Those are mitres of Dagon. Let's go to Basilica San Clement, one of the churches in Rome. Let's go down to the bottom. You will find that they used an altar which on the one side was inscribed with Christianized symbols and on the other had petroglyphs of pagan sun worship. So both religions worshipped in the same capacity, used the same venues, switched the altars, and eventually they fused into one. Church history tells us Christianity became the established religion of the Roman Empire and took the place of paganism. Christianity, as it existed in the Dark Ages, might be termed baptized paganism. It's very interesting. Let's see what, a, what the Roman Catholic Church has to say about this. The story of American Catholicism, page 37. It has often been charged that Catholicism is overlaid with many pagan incrustations. Catholicism is ready to accept that accusation and even to make it her boast. The great god Pan is not really dead. He's baptized. Aha! So paganism is within the church and the real deity behind the scenes that is worshipped is not Jesus Christ, but is Osiris in whatever form he is. In the form of Pan, you would find him in the groves. He was the god of the groves. He was the god of fear. That's where the word panic comes from. And this god Pan is the one that is worshipped either as a beautiful young man who wears and carries the sheep as the shepherd, or he is worshipped as the one with the goat's feet, depending which aspect you are looking at. Because whether you worship him in his positive sense, or whether you worship him in his negative sense, it's the same deity. It's the same whether you worship Lucifer, or whether you worship <coughs> the good side. The dark and the light are one and the same deity. Well, let me take you to this very prominent Roman Catholic cathedral. And uh, I was looking for these symbols in this Roman Catholic cathedral in the south of Germany. And here I found what they call the Statue of David. Can you see it over there with the sheep carrying the sheep around his neck? And I was wondering whether that was a representation of David or whether it was a representation of the other one. Well, it's not too difficult to tell because what has he got in his hand? He's carrying the pan flute. Now, did David ever play the pan flute? Yes or no? No. David didn't carry the pan flute. He had the harp, the hand harp. So this instrument tells me that this is pan and not the other one. Then I was interested, having seen pan over here, whether I would find pan in his negative form in the same construction, in the same building. And sure enough, there he is. There's pan with the goat's feet, and all the other symbols of paganism, including Janus, the two-headed one. So this is paganism in its highest form. If we go to St. John's Lateran, which is the church where the papacy speaks ex cathedra, or if you go to St. Peter's, the whole system over here, the whole construction is a system of pagan sun worship. The site is the ancient site. By the way, most of the cathedrals in the world are built on the very ancient pagan sites where the ancient deities were worshipped. The construction of these buildings are also in, in accordance with the ancient pagan rites. So here you have the triangle, for example, you have the famous sun dome, and you have this pillared structure which is normally known as the seat of the goddess. And if you enter into this place on the floor, you will find the official title of the papacy, which is Pontifex Maximus. Now this title comes all the way from Babylon. It has been changed through time. When Medo-Persia took over, the Medo-Persians took over the religion, the same religious system. The priests of Babylon revolted at some stage, were driven out, and fled to Pergamos. And there, the Pontex king, Pontifex Maximus, resided until Roman times when he gave his title, his vestments, 
and all the powers of being a deity as well as a high priest to the emperor. And that's why Roman emperors got the title Pontifex Maximus. And when Rome declined and the seat of the Caesar was empty, the Bishop of Rome claimed the title Pontifex Maximus, which means the bridge builder. He's the bridge between heaven and earth, so he takes the place of Jesus Christ, who is the bridge between heaven and earth. And if we want to see whether we find any of the interesting symbols, this is on the floor of the Vatican. What do we have over there? There we have the Triple Crown. Where did we see that? It's a symbol of the ancient religion that we saw there associated with the Babylonian system and the Assyrian kings. Here you have another interesting symbol. That's the lion with eagle's wings. What does the Bible define that as? It defines that as Babylon. Then you have the fleur de lis, which is the symbol of the union of the male and the female deities. And then you have the split tail, which is the symbol of Dagon. You have them all right over there. You even have the pagan seat, which they claim is Peter's seat. Now, in order to qualify for salvation, you have to enter in through the door. Notice how this is all based on the truth because the devil is counterfeiting the truth. Christ says, I am the door. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. In paganism, there are three doors. A large one, a smaller one, and a medium one, a baby one. The one standing for the male deity, the female deity, and the child deity. So you have father, mother, son, if you like. Well, here you have uh, that in the ancient Bolivian culture, that was a typical sun door. There's the symbol of the sun god at the top. And here you have the three holy stones or rocks in the Futimagaro seashore, that is in Japan. And the one would be the father, the mother, and the son. And on top of it, you also have the portal uh, of the divine couple, the door, the sun door leading inside. Also in Fatimugaru you have the bronze frogs, which are also a form of the deity because it's a form of pantheism. God is in everything. And you also have the frogs, of course, in Egypt. So these religions are not dead. They're alive and well. Here you have the winged sun door of Sendang, the Duar Mosque in the Hindu system. So Hinduism, the ancient religions, the eastern religions, they all have the sun doors of Babylon. Now who would you expect, if he was going to become the high priest of Babylon in our time, to be associated with sun doors today? Wouldn't you expect the papacy, if the Bible is correct, to have the same thing? Well, there you have it. Jubilee, John Paul II blesses the holy door on New Year's Day. Where in the Bible do you read about a holy door? Do you read about it there anyway? Jesus says, I am the door. I am the way. Come through me. But here, you use this symbol in a totally different sense. By the way, every single pagan incrustation that you can possibly think of is right here on this outfit that he is wearing. Well, the papacy also claims that he has the keys. And he calls them the keys of Peter. They are the Petra keys, because there they are in Babylon with the lion god, the keys to heaven and to hell. Do you remember that he said that the sentence of the priest is preeminent and that God has to subscribe to it? So it is the system that determines whether you go to heaven or whether you are lost and not God. Now, there you have another symbol of the lion god over there in ancient times. So the keys are a symbol of the lion. Interesting stuff that this lion god is wearing or carrying. All these ancient deities and the high priests of these deities carry such stuffs with a pine cone on the top because the pine cone is a symbol of fertility. So now if we go into the rituals of how they treated the high priest who was a reincarnation just like the Pharaoh of Osiris and therefore a representative of Osiris in the form of Horus, if you like, on this earth. In the ancient cultures, they were carried, normally in a stool like this, 
and associated with it you had fans which consisted of feathers. They could be peacock feathers and the eye on the peacock feather is the eye of the all-wise one, of the deity they worshipped. Or it could be ostrich feathers because the feather is associated with the bird which in the final analysis leads us back to the phoenix. But we'll come to that a little bit later. Now there's the papacy and here you have Pope Pius still being carried around in this very fashion, exactly like in pagan times, with exactly the same rituals with the twin keys which come from Babylon. The hand signals that are being used here are very interesting because they are all pagan sun worship systems. If you take the, the dances of the Hindus, the hand signals they use, every one is meticulously practiced because it has a meaning in terms of sun worship. Now there's the triple crown which you would find stems from paganism with which the papacy is installed or the Pope is crowned. Here the crown is being brought. There are the twin uh, tails at the back. Cardinals lying down while this takes place. Here you can see the ordination of new bishops and cardinals. Look at them lying down exactly as it was in pagan times. Here you have a triple tiara of the pagan god, 1800 BC. Note the triple crown, one, two, three. And there you have the horn tiara of the Assyrian wing god. There you have the triple crown in uh, Krishna, which is Hinduism. So the triple crown is a symbol of the ancient religion of Babylon. And there you have the winged bull cherub, also with the triple crown stemming from Assyrian times, Babylonian times. So the one who wears the triple crown now is the high priest of the ancient deities. Here's the tiara of Pope Sixtus. There are six serpents beneath the occult pyramid on this one. Now, let's look at mother and child worship. Mary and the child Jesus. This symbol is exactly the same as you have in paganism. And it's interesting that you have black Madonnas and you have white Madonnas. You have black Jesus and a white Jesus. Now in paganism it was exactly the same. Osiris was either worshipped as black or he was worshipped as white, depending on what aspect of the deity you favoured. In the game of chess, what do you have there? Black you have black and white squares. And the game of chess is designed, it's an old ancient occult game designed through Freemasonry to show that the pawn, even the pawn, can overthrow the king and outmaneuver him. In fact, you can exchange the king for the female form of the deity and become the queen, if you like. So black and white was a symbol that was already present in uh, Osiris worship and in Isis worship and you have it in Catholicism as well. You have the black Madonna and you have the white Madonna. If you go to Eastern culture you have exactly the same mother and child worship, Isi and Iswara, Shingmu and the Holy Child. There you have it in, in, in Egypt, Isis and Osiris or the birth of Horus. There you have it in the Hittite culture, mother and child worship. Of course mother and child will become prominent in Roman Catholicism. But if you want to make people believe that it stands for something else, you change the name of the deities. It's no problem. They've been changing throughout history. The Greeks didn't have the same names as the Medo-Persians. They didn't have the same names as the Egyptians. They didn't have the same names as the Babylonians, but it was one and the same deity. Because the attributes, the character was identical. Black Madonnas in the Roman Catholic Church and, and black uh, messiahs, very common. And white Madonnas and white children. Here you have it in uh, Hinduism. This comes from the British Museum. There you have the mother and there you have the holy child, the one who will be the savior. This is paganism. This has nothing to do with Christianity. 
Because Jesus says there is one mediator between man and God, and who is that? The man Christ Jesus. You don't have another mediator. There is no Mary to take a place, or any other saint, or anyone who can act as mediator. This is paganism. But it's not Christianity. And here you have the symbols, the ancient pagan symbols of Hermes and Isis, right here, with the six-pointed star in the middle of the circle, or the five-pointed stars in other places are also used. This symbol, where do you think I found this? The symbol of the ancient gods. I found this in the Jesuit cathedral in the south of Europe, in southern Germany. What is that doing there? Well, what are these symbols of sun worship doing in Czechovoa, in uh, Czechoslovakia, or in Poland, all over the world? Well, let's have a look at what the New Encyc Catholic Encyclopedia says. Pius XII affirmed strongly the queenship of Mary. So now you have a queen in heaven, but Beltus was called the queen in heaven, inserting in the calendar for May 31 a new feast of Mary Queen. So Mary is remodeled and reshaped to fit into the shoes of the ancient deity and placed in front of the people as the new mediator. That's pretty sad, because Jesus is taken out of the equation. Pius XII consecrated the world to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So this is not consecration to Christ. I'm not knocking Mary. Mary was a, was a blessed woman. She was a good woman. But her heritage is being misused here. And she was revered then as Mother and Queen, October 31, 1942, as a public recognition of her queenship. It's amazing that the ancient full, complete system of Babylonian worship only really came to full fruition in our time. Now let's have a look at some of these fascinating portrayals of transference of the mediatorial road from Jesus to Mary. This one I found at Carcopici in Rome. Here you have Jesus placing the crown of thorns on Mary's head and she has the wounds in her hands. So Mary is the one that becomes the mediator, the one who suffered and died. And it is claimed that through Mary we are saved because Mary is the one who through her obedience redeemed us whereas Eve failed. Now this ancient goddess, she was part of a fertility rite. And people would pray to her for fertility and for nurturing. So does Mary fulfill the same role? Absolutely. Let's go to the Muk Grotto, La Grotto Dule in Bethlehem, very close to the Church of the Nativity. And let me take you down there into the Muk Grotto. Here you have a symbol. It's in the church. I know it looks a bit funny and I apologize, but uh, this is the picture that they use as an icon. Mary with her breast out, symbol of fertility, where she feeds this child. And people come to this grotto in their hordes to pray for fertility problems. Now, if you look on the ceilings of the cave, you find these white splotches. And it's called the Munk Grotto because it states that these white splotches that you find over here are the milk of Mary, because when she fed the baby Jesus, her milk squirted against the walls of the, of the cave and made those white splotches. This is what it says there. And this has been authenticated by the papacy, and there is a, a testimony from the Vatican that this is an authentic miracle situation. Now I asked the, the, the guide there, who happened to be also the cantor of the church, of the nativity, that's the one, the big one, where all the trouble is in Israel now, the cantor himself. I asked him, excuse me, I'm just a little bit curious, these white splotches that we see against the walls, I've seen them in all the other caves as well. Are they also the milk of Mary? Oh, no, 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 those are natural, but these come from the milk of Mary, you see? Now, 
This might sound a bit ridiculous, but I'm just showing you that the same fertility cult surrounding this ancient deity is also ascribed to Mary. And actually, when you think about it, it's quite sick. Now, if she is queen in heaven, that means she is the goddess of heaven. Now, Mary the queen of heaven, here you have a Catholic picture where angels are crowning Mary as queen. Here you have, on an entrance in another cathedral in Europe, you have Mary being crowned by the Father and the Son as Queen of Heaven, while the worshippers at the bottom are not worshipping either the Father nor or the Son, but their homage is towards Mary. Here's another one with Jesus looking on, giving his sanction, while the archangels are crowning Mary. Here, you have another crowning of father and son, crowning Mary direct. So now it's not an angel, it's father and son direct. And here you have the Pope praying in front of a statue of Mary, and here you have him crowning Mary. So you have the whole ritual, you have the whole system of paganism built in over here to make Mary Beltis, the Queen of Heaven, the wrath subduer, the one who stands in the place of the real mediator. So if you have this picture over here, you have the Holy Spirit and above there, you have Mary in the center, and if you look at the disciples' eyes, where are they directed? Up there or to Mary? To Mary. So she has become the mediator. Now do we find this symbol in ancient times? Absolutely. This female deity was also worshipped as the dove. And there you have the double dove, which was also a symbol, two-headed one, which can later also be interpreted as a, a two-headed phoenix or a two-headed eagle, uh, which is an interesting symbol of Freemasonry, by the way. And here you have the symbol of you know the dove. Here you have this symbol of you know, which is a symbol used by the United Nations for peace. Here is another one of the dove, symbol of you know. And the dove represents the gentler force and takes the place of the Holy Spirit. So the female deity is also the one that is the one who emanates as the gentle one, the Holy Spirit. So when you find over many, many uh, preaching rosters, you find this symbol, you're not always sure. Is it a reference to the Holy Spirit, or is it actually a reference to you know? And when you find it in the solar blaze, is that what Christianity is all about? Ezekiel 8, 13 and 14, Turn ye that again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was towards the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. So ancient Israel was duped into worshipping the mother and the child. And modern Israel is being duped, talking about spiritual Israel, to do the same. Interesting thing about these ancient gods is that they were also always associated with dark places. They were associated with the groves. The goddess Diana, she was the goddess of hunting. And uh, very often a deer or something like that was associated with her as well. And she also, in all the pagan cultures, emanated out of the cave. She came out of the cave. So here you have, in these uh, depictions over here, you have these statues inside caves. Now these are in the cathedrals. This one is in the main Jesuit cathedral in um, Czechoslovakia. And there you have these deities, or statues of them, within caves. And you have the letters IHS above, which today they tell you means in his service. But of course it doesn't mean in his service at all. The Catholic Church says it refers to Iesus hominum salvator, which means Jesus the Savior of men. But if you belong to an occult circle, you will recognize it as Isis Horus Sept 
the Egyptian trinity. Isis, Horus, Seb. Seb was the dark one. He is the other side of Osiris. Osiris and Seb are really interchangeable. The one is the light and the other one is the darkness. The one is good, the other one is evil. If you would like, you could worship them today. In occult circles they do. They worship them as Lucifer, the light bearer, or as Satan. Satanism and Luciferian worship worship one and the same deity. And that is why Luciferians and Satanists are often good buddies. The one practicing the light, the other one practicing the darkness. Satanists have to do good deeds in order to appease their God, and they have to sacrifice to their God. Luciferians have to do exactly the same thing. And they can interchange, they can sit on both chairs, because it doesn't matter whether you worship on the dark side or whether you worship on the light side. And it gets frightening, because you cannot tell the two apart sometimes. Well, if you go to the ancient cathedrals, this is uh, the cathedrals in Cologne, you have the symbol of Apollo, the sun god there, and then you have the moon and the stars, sun, moon and stars. That's the three aspects of the sun god, like you had Brahma, Siva, Vishnu. Brahma, the sun rising, Siva, the sun at the meridian, Vishnu, the victim man, the sun plunges into the waters at night, becomes Dagon, the fish god, or Poseidon, rises out of the water and is worshipped, either as Poseidon or the serpent or the, or the um, triune form. In this cathedral over here, you have very interesting relief. Here you have the lion with eagle's wings, with the sun at the back. A very prominent Babylonian symbol, and uh, the Roman Catholic Church calls this a symbol of St. Mark. Now I'm sure you'll find great difficulty finding a lion with eagle's wings with a solar blaze behind the head as a symbol of St. Mark, would you? Yes. Now what is he looking at? He's looking at a circle over here with a cross in it. And that was one of the main symbols of the solar deity. This was a symbol of Lucifer, the symbol of the circle with a cross in it. You find it in many, many organizations today. The other symbol, of course, is the symbol of the bull. Remember, the bull is the number one letter. The one, the symbol of, of the light bearer, Lucifer, also with the blaze behind him. They call him St. Luke, of Marcos or Luke. And there you have, again, the same symbol. Also butterflies, symbol of fertility cult. The butterfly goes from flower to flower. The bee is also a symbol of the fertility cult. It also goes from flower to flower to flower. Young girls, if you have the butterfly tattooed onto your shoulder, it has a much deeper meaning than you might think. Let's see if we can find the symbols of the bull and the lion. Sure we can. There they are, the Isis and Uranus temple number two, three. Encyclopedia of the Unexplained Magic, Occultism and Parapsychology. Isis is associated with both the bull cult and the lion cult and the phoenix cult. There's the phoenix. All right, back to Catholicism. If you go to Roman Catholic gardens associated with cathedrals or with monasteries, in the garden you will find Mary often depicted in a cave situation. It's the goddess of the grove. Where do you read something like that in the Bible? The goddess of the grove. And Mary, in the cathedral's basements, is also in the cave and comes out of the cave. And here you have the occult way of writing Mary. The M is capitalized over here, M. The M is the sigma on its side. And it's the symbol that is used by the occult world. Masonry, free masonry, uses the M as well as one of its chief identifying features. Then you have the A as a triangle, and it's a sexagesimal triangle, 60, 60, 60 degrees. It's a 666 triangle. The dot of the I is superimposed on top, and the dot becomes the symbol of the sun. It also has another connotation, which is somewhat naughty, which we will leave out. And then you're left with Ria, 
who was the ancient goddess of the East. So here you have her in her full glory coming out of the cave. And interesting, what you will also find in paganism is three arches, as you can see it over there. Now I've already shown you three arches in ancient temples when we went to Petra. Remember? We went to the one temple and I showed you three arches and I said that has to do with paganism. Now in Catholicism you find three arches associated with the deities and the goddess or the gods often come out of the cave. That's why at Lourdes you have the Pope praying in the grotto. Now this is not something that is just for um, Catholicism. It's all the pagan religions. The goddess Diana she was the god of the forests. And then she was also the god, the goddess of hunting. So that is what you have. Now here, in Japan, you have another interesting feast. This is the sun goddess, Amaterasu, as she emerges, emerges out of the cave. In their annual festivals, they celebrate this goddess. Notice that her face is painted white and her hands are often painted white. Now when you have miming, for example, you have the people with their hands painted white and their, their faces painted white. These are ancient rituals that can be taken back to sun worship. And we bring them right into our churches these days as something unique and exciting. And in the final analysis, it's sun worship. If you take the, the African culture, when they become initiated into the fertility of manhood, the fertility cult, then they paint their faces white with kaolin clay and their hands. So this is where it comes from. So these ancient goddesses were all the goddesses of the caves. And she's the one who crushes the serpent's head. But Christ is the one who should crush the serpent's head. But the, the irony is, that she doesn't only crush the serpent's head, she nurtures the serpent. Because the serpent through her represents death and resurrection. It is the counterfeit of the death and the resurrection of Christ. So through the female, you have the fertility power to produce new life. And therefore it has very heavy sexual connotations, this religion. Do we find the same in Catholicism? Yes, unfortunately. Because Catholicism today is the ultimate form of the ancient Babylonian religion. And therefore, sadly, the papacy must be the high priest of the ancient occult pagan religion. Here you have Mary, dressed in blue and white. And there you have her standing on the serpent, just like the ancient goddess. And she's standing in the half moon which is the symbol of the womb and is the symbol of the female deity. And now let's see what Roman Catholicism says. This one comes from uh, the cathedral in, in St. Mary's Cathedral in Cape Town. And the sinner says here to the Immaculate Mary, the vows of my baptism, I renounce Satan. And then it says, In the presence of the heavenly court I choose thee this day for my mother and mistress. I deliver and consecrate to thee as thy slave my body and soul, my goods both interior and exterior, and even the value of my good actions, past, present, and future, leaving to thee the entire and full right of disposing of me, and all that belongs to me without exception, according to thy good pleasure, for the greater glory of God in time and in eternity. Amen. So, who then becomes the ultimate deity in your life? Is it Jesus or is it Mary? Must be Mary. So you have replaced Jesus with another deity. Now I was stunned. I was stunned. When I came here in Syria, I was recently in Syria, and I did a tour of those ancient sites, archaeological sites, and I came here to a town called Sadanea, which is in a totally Islamic land, and there you have this huge statue of Mary, and you have this huge statue of the deer. Now the story goes that the king, an ancient king, was traveling through here and he saw the deer and he went hunting the deer 
and he left his troops behind and as he pulled his, his bow and his arrow to shoot the deer, it transformed itself in front of him into Mary. And Mary said to him, you must build me a monastery in this place. Now this is a site of worship not only for Catholics but for Muslims as well. Now, this is interesting because this is where religions meet. And here miracles take place. In this particular monastery they have an icon and this icon was supposedly drawn by none other than Luke. It's an icon of Mary with child which is a bit weird because Luke didn't know Jesus as a baby but besides that the icon leaks tears of oil and the oil stands there and you can take this oil as something to cleanse you or for holy purposes and as someone was walking out with the oil they spilled a drop and of course it changed into the image of Mary. Now this is the monastery built on an ancient hill so immediately I was suspicious and thought to myself, if this monastery is standing on an ancient hill, then it's an ancient high place, and I should find the evidence of the ancient pagan worship of the deity in the form of the ancient arches. So I went walking all around this monastery and over this hill, and I was so pleased to find it. But nevertheless, there it is. The monastery stands on top of the hill. It's an ancient high place. That is the cave. It is sealed with a cross where the ancient worship took place. There are the triple arches and they have Greek inscriptions and they are dedicated to the ancient pagan deities. So Catholicism is the age-old Babylonian religion encrusted. Here is the place where the drop fell and they have this bar around it with all these locks on it. I don't know what purpose the locks serve, they don't lock anything but there are lots of them, can you see? And there it is. That's where the drop fell and it formed the image of Mary. Let me enlarge it for you, there it is. And this is the ancient uh, painting that was supposedly painted by Luke. So you have all these ancient incrustations and pagan forms of worship. Now the little baby, which is supposedly Jesus, is here worshipped in this cathedral in Rome as Tammuz. Now they call him Bambino, baby Jesus. But look at him, crowned in gold and silver. This is the most precious little doll that you can imagine. And here are all the, the letters that are written to Bambino. This is Tammuz. Jesus never came like that, did he? My Jesus was born in a manger. He didn't come dressed in gold and jewels and silver and being worshipped as a little baby like that. These are the ancient or the letters that are written. Catholicism teaches that you can be forgiven in advance for your sins, even to this day. Here you have the La Santa Scala, uh, these are the st this is the staircase Catholicism claims some amazing stories to this day it sounds unbelievable that this staircase is the one that Jesus stood on when he was condemned by Pilate and he had the crown of thorns and the blood dripped down and there are drops of blood supposedly still on the staircase and they've put little plaques over it now you can crawl up that staircase and if you do this and you kiss the places where the, the drops of blood supposedly fell, then you get 90 days absolution. Three months free, ahead of time. Go and have fun, you're forgiven. Three months ahead of time. <laughs> By the way, where did that staircase come from? It was of course in Jerusalem. How did it get here? Well, Rome claims, and you can find this today right there, that it appeared one night transported by angels from Jerusalem to Rome. And there it stood one morning and they built the cathedral around it. You can believe it if you like. <laughs> Let's have a look at the Mass. Well this photograph comes from the Church of All Nations and you will notice over here that the altar stands on a rock. Now in all pagan religions you have holy stone worship, holy rock worship. 
And God in the Old Testament constantly warns against those that have their holy stones and their holy rocks. Catholicism is encrusted with it. Catholics teach that the sacrifice of the Mass is and ought to be considered one and the same as that of the cross. As the victim is one and the same, namely Christ our Lord. This is Catechism of the Council of Trent. This is not just some source. So Christ is sacrificed again and again every time the Mass is said. They crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put Him to open shame, Hebrews 6 verse 6. The Bible says by how many sacrifices did He make forever? One, one. one sacrifice forever. So the sacrifice of the Mass is in a sense a symbol of the victory of Lucifer over Christ. He keeps him sacrificed. And the crucifix, where Christ stays on the crucifix, is a symbol of the victory of Lucifer over Christ. Now in paganism, the cross was also worshipped as a symbol of the sun, of course. And Lucifer made that one of his main symbols. Now, Hebrews 10 verse 14 says, By one offering, one sacrifice, he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. If you look at the Vatican, this comes from the Vatican Museum, you have an angel supporting the triple crown, supporting Christ on the cross, keeping him on the cross. So the crucifix, in a sense, is a symbol of victory over Christ. And the eating of the bread is an ancient pagan ritual. The Eucharist or host has the letters IHS on it, Isis Horus Sep, and the host from the Latin meaning the sacrifice, the round wafer whose roundness is so important in the Roman mystery is another system of symbol of Baal, Babylon, myths, mystery, religion, ancient and modern, page 129. So the roundness is a symbol of the sun. And there you have it in the even-sided cross, which is also the symbol of the sun god, the sun deity. All right, there we have it. In the Assyrian, you had the symbol of the sun, which was round, and it was placed in the half moon, which was the symbol of the birth into the womb of the sun god. And it was called Baal Hadad. And it was also often a star in a moon. And the star represents the star from the east. It was called the dog star. And it was a representation of Sirius. Now, Remember the ancient Magi, the three wise men that came to Jesus. Is that right? Now occultism today in the Masonic form teaches that the wise men followed the star in the east and followed it to Bethlehem. That's what they teach. Question. If the wise men came from the east, then where was the star relative to them over Bethlehem? The it was in the west. So in actual fact, the star that they are serving is not the star which represents Jesus Christ, but the one in the east which represents Sirius, the dog star, and is a symbol of Lucifer, not of Jesus Christ. So, that was the ancient Mesopotamian symbol of Baal Hadad, the star or the round disk. It doesn't matter whether it's the one or the other. The one is simply the form Horus, which is the rebirth, and the other one is the form Osiris, which is the adult form. It doesn't matter which one it is. So here you have the symbol of Osiris, the round disk, in the half moon, which is the symbol of Isis, or there you have the symbol of Horus, which is the, the birth of the sun, uh, the S-O-N and the half moon. Now who uses that symbol today? Which religion has that as its main symbol? Islam. Islam has this as its main symbol. And Islam and Catholicism stand side by side. You go to the, to the Middle East. You go to Islamic countries where evangelism <coughs> is forbidden. Where you may not proselyte in the name of Jesus Christ. You will find the mosque and the Catholic cathedral next to each other 
wherever you go. Whether you go to Amman, whether you go to Jerusalem, whether you go to Syria, you do it. And you will see the Roman Catholic Cathedral and this one standing side by side. Why? Because it's the same deity. It's Baal Hadad. Let's have a look. Here is the Pope with the wafer. The roundness representing Baal. Here he is with a cup. Bacchus was the god of wine and drunkenness and they served fermented wine whereas the biblical symbol was no leaven in the bread and therefore if the leaven is a symbol of sin then it must have been unfermented wine as well but they use fermented wine and the round symbol and they place it in a monstrance which has a half moon in it and by the way on this particular Catholic monstrance you have wavy rays of the sun and straight ones. The wavy ones represent the female deity, the straight ones the male deity, and this one has the letters SFS on it. Now in the mysteries you have to work out what these letters mean. S was the sixth letter in the Greek alphabet. F is the sixth letter in whose alphabet? Ours. SFS stands for six six six. You have to know their little tricks. Here's another monstrance and there you can see it very typically the half moon and then when the mass is said at a high mass then the disc is placed in there and you have exactly the same symbol for the deity that is used in Islam. Exactly the same symbol. And there's another one, another monstrance for the wafer. It's placed in there and you have Baal Hadad. Well, there you have it too in ancient uh, Hittite culture. And there you have the symbol of the peacocks, by the way, as well. There you have the half moon. There you have the face of Apollo, the circle. And then you have the laurel wreath, normally with 13 leaves around it. Oh, by the way, which mighty organization on our planet uses that symbol? United the United Nations. That's very interesting. UN. 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 That, by the way, is another name for another deity. But we'll come to that later. Here you have Mitra. Mitraism. Now Mitra is the one who kills the bull. And uh, here you have a dog helping him. And there you have a serpent helping him. And you have a scorpion stinging the bull in a very strategic place. And uh, if you look at the hat of Mitra, it looks like that. That's the Mitraic hat, Mitraism. Now I want you to look at that hat carefully, because in a later lecture, we'll pick it up. You'll be stunned where we pick up the hat of Mitra. Very interesting. The structure of the cult was hierarchical through a series of seven grades, each of which had a special symbol. Corax was the raven under Mercury, Nymphus was a made-up word meaning male bride. These are the levels of Mitraism. Under Venus, the goddess. So the priests of Mitra had to be celibate because they were married as a male bride to the goddess Venus. Do we have a religious system today where the male priests have to be celibate? Yeah. All right. Then we have Miles under Mars. We have Leo under Jupiter. Persis under Luna, the moon. Heliodromos under the sun, Sol, the sun. And finally, we have Pater. That's the highest grade, the top grade of Mitraism. Father under Saturnius. And Saturn is the god of the underworld. Saturn is the god of death. Saturn is the equivalent of the god Seb in the Egyptian. Uh, trilogy. Now, Pater, Father, do we have a religious system today where the priest is celibate, where the deity is referred to, the one that is the mediator is a female, and where he is called Father? Do we have a system like that today? Well, you know, they say, if it, let me not, not, not be strange here, let's just say, if it looks exactly like the old system, then what's the possibility that it is the old system? 100%. 100%. I agree with you. The Egyptian sun god Osiris, he was worshipped by feeding 
a round wafer bread, exactly as they do today. And this host is carried ritually through the streets in Catholicism as it was in pagan times. Baal Hadad, the system, is the system of Rome. Do you think in the final analysis that the big religions of the world will have a problem in identifying with the Bishop of Rome? Yes or no? No. No, they won't have a problem because under layers of strata, of hidden doctrine, and what the masses know and what the insiders know, at the very top they are one religion and they serve the same master. Now, I'm not going to tell you who served the master because I could be accused. Let's ask the Bible. What does the Bible say? Who gave him his seat, his power and great authority? Revelation chapter 13. The dragon. The dragon. And who's that according to the Bible? Satan. It's Satan. So that's Luciferian worship. That's what it is. Here you have the symbols of sun, moon and star in Catholicism on all their cathedrals. And this one is fascinating. This is a Catholic cathedral in, in Germany as well. I was stunned. It's all over the place. Look at this. Even in their clocks. They know what they're doing. They know what they're doing. This is a modern building. Here you have the symbol of the moon and the star. And when the clock goes round, they have the birth of the sun god. Baal Hadad, Baal Hadad, Baal Hadad, Baal Hadad. Telling the world who the deity is. That's why you have her over here in the half moon with the blaze of the sun straight and curled rays there you have the full catastrophe as well straight curved in the half moon standing on the serpent these are ancient pagan deities there you have the the trinity as well the half moon with mary and child in the half moon same in all these ancient paintings and the symbol of the bird feeding his flesh to his young symbol of the phoenix who rises from the ashes and gives his life. Six dialogues on the Lord's Day. Sunday being the, lo the day on which the Gentiles solemnly adored that planet, the sun, they called it that. The Christians thought fit to keep the same day and the same name of it that they might not appear causelessly peevish and by that means hinder the conversion of the Gentiles. This is Roman Catholic thinking. So in other words, Sunday Worship of the day of the sun comes in. The Bible says, Her priests have violated my law and have profaned my holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and the profane. Neither have they showed any difference between unclean and clean. And they have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths. And I am profaned amongst them. We saw how Rome shifted the Sabbath day from the Saturday to the Sunday to bring it in line with pagan worship. Webster's Dictionary says, Sunday so-called because this day was anciently dedicated to the sun or its worship, the first day of the week. There's a reason for that. It's because that really is the worship. They're not deceived. Those in high positions know exactly what they are doing. They know it exactly. Here's the face of the child in the fertility symbol on a Roman Catholic altar. And what you have around there I will not explain. Let's rather leave it alone. Male, female symbol, face of Apollo. The Catholic world says the sun was the foremost, what is that, symbol of heathen. Hence the church would seem to have said, keep that old pagan name, it shall remain consecrated, sanctified. And thus the pagan Sunday dedicated to Baal, to Balder, became the Christian Sunday sacred to Jesus. This Jesus is not Jesus of Nazareth, this is the other Savior, Yahweh the Savior, the other God in the place, the counterfeit Savior. There you have the, the sun as a symbol over there. There you have a symbol on a stained glass window of the changed law. Only three on the one tablet, there should be four. There you have the face of Apollo on a Greek temple. And of course you will find it on the Roman Catholic altar because it's the same deity. Can you see now why this beast has lion, Babylonian, Greek, the leopard component, the bear component, the feet, because the, for example, the tiara that the Pope is crowned with comes from Medo-Persian times. There you have it in Scandinavia, 
They have those other symbols on the walls, let's forget about them. And you have the symbols of the sun all around. This is fertility cult stuff. And this whole issue over here is a symbol of the victory of Lucifer over Adonai. We'll have to go into occultism to see that. It's really quite scary. And uh, we'll come to that. There's another triple crown over there, supposedly representing God the Father. So here you have the crucifix being carried around, the symbol of the death of the one and the resurrection of the other. What about halos? Well, there you have a halo in the Japanese God of Happiness. There you have a halo in Krishna. There you have a halo in a Hindu deity. It's a symbol of the sun. And there you have a halo in a Roman Catholic figure. This one I photographed in the cathedral, brand new cathedral, that they built in London. The Roman Catholic Cathedral. It has so many pagan symbols, it just boggles the mind. And by the way, the crozier is the serpent. Can you see that? They lean upon the serpent. Very interesting. Well, here's another uh, Eastern deity with the halo behind it. And there are the Japanese and Chinese ones with the halos behind them. And the symbol of the cross. There you have it in Mesopotamia. It was a symbol of the sun god. This is long before Christ. Long before Christ. There you have it again in a Mesopotamian relief. And there you have it, this cross in the form of an ankh. An ankh is a symbol of life. The deity gives life. And the pagan priests wore it around their necks. So you have this line going around, coming down, and very often stretching up here. Now who wears something like that today? Roman Catholic priests wear it. So there you can see the line going around, the ribbon going around, is this part going around the neck, and very often they have the lines going up the side, symbolizing exactly the same thing. This is a statue of Mary holding lightning in her hand. Now what's Mary got to do with lightning? Well, there's a statue of Zeus with lightning in his hand. Because whether you use the male form or the female form, this deity being androgenic, it doesn't matter. It's one and the same deity. Pagan symbols and hand signals. This is the pagan symbol of the ancient trinity. It's also shown like this. And there you have it in Roman Catholicism. <coughs> And there you have it in the ancient statue of Jupiter, which today is revered as the statue of Peter, by the way, but it comes straight out of a pagan temple into the Vatican. And there you have him with the ancient pagan symbol. There you have someone kissing his feet. And there you have the same symbol in the um, Nordic tribes. There you have the hand of Buddha, Exactly the same thing. Or you have it in this form, the three fingers. There you have it in the papacy. There you have the same symbol in Buddhism. Can you see that? If they all use exactly the same, aren't they all exactly the same? Behind the scenes. Now let's get to a little bit more modern cathedrals. This symbol of the sun over there, and this triple yin-yang, which is the ancient symbol of sun worship you find in the Roman Catholic Cathedral. And this one here is phenomenal. Here is the symbol on the floor of the cathedral in London. The main Catholic Cathedral. It is the ancient triple yin-yang, which they've reduced now to two, just reflecting good and evil. And in the middle, it makes this structure, which is the mitzotom. Have you noticed that on these animated TV production, kiddies games on television, the superheroes, superwoman and super this and super that, they carry the mitzvotom, symbol of the sun god, symbol of Lucifer, and they throw it and go, Yip! ninjas also use it. The mitzvotom, symbol of Lucifer on the floor of a Roman Catholic cathedral. If you're not satisfied yet, let me take you to this Roman Catholic Cathedral. This is one where the prominent people of the world 
I'm talking about the world leaders where they meet. What's this on the door of a Roman Catholic cathedral? Do you recognize it? It's a yin yang on the door of a Roman Catholic cathedral. And inside the cathedral, what is this? Black and white squares representing the good and the evil aspects as you find it in masonry. And what is that? The phoenix rising out of the ashes, symbol of the resurrection and life-giving force of the light-bearer Lucifer. Very interesting. Well, here you have um, the trident. There's another trident. Now, some tridents are depicted with wavy and straight lines. That's again union of the male and the female. Poseidon, Neptune, all of them had the trident. Do you think we'll find the trident in Roman Catholicism? Well, we should, if it's a symbol. There you have the trident over there in a, as a symbol in Hinduism. And there you have it in the church. In Roman Catholic and in Anglican churches, if you look carefully, you'll find the trident either just blatantly or on top of Christ. Or in some cases over here, this one has the full catastrophe. He has the pagan hand sign, he has the pagan globe, plus he has the tri trident over there. Uh, here you have the fleur de lis in the ancient Assyrian cherub god. There's the fleur de lis. They use this as a symbol because it has a, no, you know, a fertility connotation. Here's Isis with the fleur de lis. Would you expect it in Catholicism? This comes from paganism. Well, yes, the fleur de lis in Catholicism in a Catholic church on a Catholic altar. There you have the fleur de lis coming, this is in Nürnberg in the cathedral, on the head of Christ and coming out of both of his ears. Rather sad. One can't hear very well with the fleur de lis in e e each ear. And then, of course, you have beads, mantras. Have you heard of mantras? Well, Matthew chapter 6, verse 7. When you pray, use not vain repetition as the heathen do, for they think they shall be heard for their much speaking. A mantra is a repetitive prayer to put you into an altered state of consciousness. And that is what we have in the music today, where young people, when they are taken to certain festivities where drugs often are associated, they also use mantras, mantras built into the music, to place them in an altered state of consciousness, so that another power can take over. So mantras, repetitive prayer, are a symbol of all the pagan religions. You will find it in Islam, you will find it in Catholicism, you'll find it in all of them. And where does it come from? From Babylon. There you have the pagan priests of Baal with their mantra beads in their hands. There you have Hindu deities with their mantra beads in their hands. And this, of course, is another very interesting symbol. This is the eye of Osiris. Hathor, the eye of the god Osiris, the one-eyed god. There you have it on the altar of a Roman Catholic cathedral in France. It is always the symbol of Osiris, the symbol of the male form, Osiris, or the female form, the cow, Hathor, the sacred cow, the female deity. She was worshipped as in the fertility cult as a cow giving milk nurturing the young, or as a beautiful woman. And there you have the same symbol. The triangle is sexagesimal, that means it has 60, 60 degrees mostly, 666 six, six triangle. In the, in, the, in the mysteries, the zero counts for nothing. So if you have 360 degrees, you have 3 plus 6 plus 0, you have 9. 9 is the 6 upside down. 9 is one of the highest numbers in occultism. There you have and the same symbol on a, a Roman Catholic altar. Here you have it in um, the New Age movement. And when you go to the cathedrals, you'll find it everywhere. Symbol of Hathor or symbol of Osiris. There it is in front of a Jesuit cathedral on a stella. Also, you have over here the shell, symbol of the universe. There were 360 degrees in the universe. 
there were 36 rooms. By the way, all our systems are incrustated with this pagan culture. If you take a pack of cards, uh, there are four suits, there are four seasons, there are 52 cards, there are 52 weeks in a year because you had this movement through the zodiac of the planets. And this is all depicted in card playing, in chess, in all these games. But in any case, the shell was a symbol of the zodiac and the movement through the zodiac. Poseidon was one of them. Here you have in Roman Catholic Church, you have um, John the Baptist using the Coptic shell with the pagan symbol to baptize Jesus. By the way, the water is in the form of the female deity symbol. And there you have it over the, the arches of the churches. There you have Venus born out of the shell. And of course it is one of the prominent symbols in the Catholic crest in St. Peter's. Every single pagan symbol, you will find it there. There it is in paganism, you'll find it in Catholicism with the Trinity involved. The globe, another symbol of the pagan deity, here's the god Mitra, holding the globe representing the universe. He is the other deity. The biggest globe in the world, where will you find it? On top of St. Peter's. By the way, that is a Rosicrucian cross, and it has those symbols over there, and they have also a fertility um, connotation, which we don't have to discuss in any detail. There's a globe as well. You'll find it all over the place, the globe symbol of Mitra. This is Tammuz, but they say it's Jesus, with prayer beads around his neck and with a globe in his hand. Same with this statue over here, the globe in the hand. Sacred heart worship, which you find in Catholicism, there you have it in Quetzalcoatl, you'll find it through all the pagan cultures, it comes from Babylon. And if you go to the Vatican, and you look at the greatest centre of this type of worship, you'll find all the pagan symbols of sun worship right here in St. Peter's, the sun worship, the moon worship, you have the serpentine pillars of Bernini's canopy, you have every aspect of pagan worship. You even have the dome which is known as the sun dome, symbol of sun worship. And on the floors of the cathedrals you will find the symbols of the zodiac. That is why stargazing, astrology, all of these things, that was the culture of the Chaldeans. And today you have your stargazers and your people telling the presidents of the world which way they should move. The world hasn't changed at all. Golden Door, the chapel of St. Ignatius. This is in San Francisco. There you have the unicorn, and there you have all the ancient, ancient systems, right down to the, from the phoenix to the dragon, to the peacock, to the ancient P and the X, which stands for 660 plus the circle, which stands for the six or the nine, remember the circle around it, 360 degrees, 3 plus 6 plus 0 is 9, 9 is the 6 upside down. So you can have that pagan symbol on many of the altars and it stands for 666. That's what it stands for whether we like it or not. You have the, the staff and the mitre and the unicorn. Now, let's get a little bit closer and find out whether the Pope literally represents the ancient deities. Here you have the eagle god with a pine cone. That was the symbol of fertility. Here you have the ancient winged cherub with a pine cone, which was the symbol of his power through the fertility cult. The biggest pine cone and staff you'll find here, one of the biggest at least, here in Osiris worship. This is the Egyptian deity. Osiris had the, the shepherd's rod with a pine cone on it. And there you have a a Hindu deity with a pine cone in his hand, so they're all the same. The pine cone, symbol of the Mexican religion, pine trees, Christmas, all those interesting things. There you have Dionysius with his staff with a pine cone on it, a little bit of Bacchus with a pine cone on it, and there's the biggest pine cone in the world in the court of the Vatican. There's another one in the Vatican court with a symbol of the female deity, because Isis always walked with two peacocks, symbol of fertility in the Vatican Square, 
And there is the crozier, the shepherd's rod of the Pope, and it always has the pine cone on it. Do you think they know what they are doing, or do you think this is pure chance and incidental? Well, it can no longer be chance. It can no longer be chance. This is the staff that the present Pope uses. It's the same one, by the way, which was used by the previous Pope. And uh, it has this cross, the bent cross. And it has Jesus down there, like that, making the sexagesimal triangle. There's the pine cone on his staff. And the bent cross is the symbol of Lucifer. You'll find it in Luciferian worship, you'll find it in Satan worship, and you'll find it in places where you will not expect it. What about the pagan feasts in Christianity? The solar symbol and the feasts of France, you had summer solstice and winter solstice, those have become the feast of St. John, and the feast of the Immaculate Conception where they jump over the fire. These are Roman Catholic festivals, they are pagan festivals. Here you have Euro European sun worship and druid worship, exactly the same thing, the lighting of the fire, the circular movement of the druids. The druids today are alive and well and living in Britain, did you know that? And do you know that druid worship, well let's not get into the details, let me leave a little bit for later, it gets very exciting. At the tower burning, that's the festival of St. Jean and Orbs, that is still used today. What about Christmas? Well, Christmas is celebrated everywhere. Christmas is a representation of the serpent who gives life to the tree, Osiris, who was cut down, and through the life of the serpent, the life-giving serpent, the tree sprouts and gives rise to a young shoot. This was decorated with round globes and lighted up in ancient times to celebrate the rebirth of Osiris in the form of Horus. They would also take the log, which they called the jewel log, and throw it in the fire, representing the death and the suffering of Osiris with his resurrection. The mistletoe, symbol of fertility and love. If you stand under the mistletoe and get kissed, that's it, you're in love. Well, what was the sacrifice? to the gods on that particular day. The main sacrifice were two unclean animals. It was the goose and it was the pig. If you go to Europe, in Germany, the dinner for Christmas is the Christmas goose. If you go to England, it is the gammon. The gammon and the goose, the two offerings. Later, different birds were substituted, but the pig deity is right there in with it. Here you have uh, the goddess Amaterasu, Soraya worship. Here you go, whether it's Amaterasu or Soraya is incidental. Here Soraya rides through the heavens with his horse-drawn carriage. And on the winter solstice, Soraya rides through the heavens drawn by his carriage. Well, depending where you were, here you have uh, Soraya being drawn through the heavens with a horse-drawn carriage. If you were the god uh, Zeus, for example, in Greece, then you were drawn through the clouds and through the sky on the solstice, which was the 25th of December, you were drawn through a, by a carriage drawn by goats. But if you lived in Scandinavian countries where there was snow, what do you think the animal was? that drew the sun god through the skies on the 25th of December. Well, there you have uh, the medallion of Sibel. You have her in a carriage and you have the sun and the half moon with a star being born in it. And there again you have the Indian miniature Soraya. It's exactly the same Soraya, whether it is Sibel, or whether it is the one form of the deity or the other. If you go to the Versailles in France, Helios and his sun chariot coming out of the water, being carried away. These are the symbols. They celebrate um, Elijah's transformation as he's riding through the sky. They make a sun deity out of it. They take all the symbols of Christianity and change them to pagan symbols. Now here's the Hittite right on. Can you see that? Same as in Scandinavia. The carriage was drawn by reindeer. Now where does that symbol come from? That's an interesting name, right? Santa. 
Now, does that stand for saint or is that sancta? Santa is something totally different. Santa, if you re-scramble that and you take this whole system into consideration, then you could also get Satan. Now, who designed the little happy man that rides through the skies and made it available to all our children? Well, it was Walt Disney. And Walt Disney was a 33 degree Freemason. Now, what is the god of the 33 degree Freemason? Well, we'll have to ask them what it is. And for that, because I'm not going to say it, I could get into trouble. Let them say it, and they can get into trouble, right? Come to a future lecture, and let's see who the god of the 33 degree Freemason is. Let's have a look at the origin of Santa Claus. Fourth century, fourth century historical evidence shows that St. Nicholas never existed as a human. He was rather Christianized version of the pagan sea god, the Greek god Poseidon, the Roman god Neptune, the Teutonic god Holt Nikar, Nicolations. By the way, the Bible says in the book of Revelations that God hates those that adhere to the doctrines of the Nicolations, those who served at the throne of Nicholas. Revelation says that. But here we have Nicholas riding through the skies. And our children say, please, St. Nicholas, bring us a present. Where's Jesus in Christmas? It's got nothing to do with Christmas. In the early centuries of the Christian church, many pagan gods and goddesses were humanized and converted to Christian saints. When the church created the persona St. Nicholas, they adopted Poseidon's title, the sailor. They picked up the last name from Nica. Various temples of Poseidon became shrine of St. Nicholas, of the Nicolaitans, which God hates. This comes from the Women's Encyclopedia of Myths and Secrets. It's not me saying these things. What's the theology of Santa? Santa, Santa is taught to most children. He is omnipresent. He can visit hundreds of millions of homes in one night. He's omniscient. He monitors each child. He is all-seeing, all-knowing. He knows if they were good, if they were bad. Uh, he does have great powers. He can manufacture gifts for hundreds of millions of children in one night, each delivered to the correct child. He's all good, all judge. He judges which children have shown good behavior, and he's eternal. He never dies. What do you make of him then? Well, ecclesiastical history of Socrates it attributes the introduction of the festival of Easter into the church to the perpetuation of an old usage, just as many other customs. This is Encyclopedia Britannica. So Easter is the Feast of Easter. Did you know that pope, the Pope had the calendar shifted to bring it in line? That's why we have the Gregorian calendar today. To bring it in line with the pagan Feast of Easter and force this worship onto the Christian world? It's paganism. We think we're Christian, but we're not. Let's ask the Catholic Encyclopedia. That should help. The Easter fire is lit on top of the mountain. This is a custom of pagan origin. The church adopted the observance into the Easter ceremony. They admit it. Well, Easter, the egg, Heliopolis, Typhon, the egg. Where do you read about Easter bunnies and eggs in the Bible? <laughs> I haven't seen it, but here it is. Pre-Christian painted eggs. It comes from paganism. It is sun worship. And the bun with a cross on it, symbol of Tammuz. I see the woman baking cakes for the queen of heaven, symbol of the goddess worship. So we have exactly the same, the hot cross bun. Now let me just put you straight on something. I'm not hooked on symbols. I don't care what symbols they use. I don't care what flowers they use. I don't care what symbols they use. It doesn't matter. It's just a symbol. The fact that Satan applies that symbol to his worship is his business. If somebody gives me a hot cross bun, I'll eat it. Cross or no cross. It's just a bun. But the fact of the matter it is that there is a deeper connotation. The Roman bath, England, notice the serpent symbol. The serpent is the life giver. You find it in Egypt. You find it in Hinduism. Everywhere you find the serpent. It is the most prominent symbol. There you have the Hydra. You find it everywhere. Would you find it in Catholicism? Of course. Here's a modern cathedral with a serpent. 
and the main crest of the Vatican has the dragon serpent on it and the dragon on the papal crest in the Vatican Museum Vatis means the diviner Khan is the serpent Vatican means the divining serpent dragon worship that's what it is the Bible says the dragon gave him his seat and power and great authority there's the same symbol as was used for pagan Rome because the Vatican has taken the seat of Caesar it's one and the same thing so there's the ancient symbol of the dragon on a Roman bridge the Vatican has just taken it over the greatest serpents in the world you will find on Bernini's canopy in Rome it's interesting that St. Paul's Cathedral which was a Protestant cathedral has been totally rebuilt and now has a duplicate of St. of Bernini's canopy inside it and on this altar you have the birth process taking place in Pope Joan the only female Pope who was a male but turned out to be a female and gave birth they don't hide it they put it onto the altar it's part of the fertility rite the bee on that same altar symbol of the pagan fertility rite just as the crozier of the goddess was a serpent so the croziers of ceremonial bishops dress is also either a dragon or a serpent as you would find it in Egypt as covering cherub serpents solar wheels now it gets exciting I'm almost done hang around a Syrio-Babylonian altar with the solar wheel notice there's the straight one and there's the curved one so you have two crosses one and the other they don't always have to be curved and straight but the one represents the female the curved one and the other one represents the union of the male and the female so you have eight spokes in this system this is called the solar wheel now there you have the solar wheel in a Buddhist temple and there you have it in Egyptian uh, the Osiris riding the solar wheel see it's just eight spokes and that's really what it is is the two crosses symbol of the Sun God coming together there you have it in the Catholic Cathedral in Notre Dame and there you have it on that famous temple at Karanak in India where they have all those terrible sculptures which are associated with that form of worship there's another solar wheel with the Madonna holding it there's a a modern one on a Roman Catholic altar and the biggest solar wheel in the world you will find in the Vatican Square there it is now this is an ex interesting story this solar wheel there it is you know, eight spokes if you count them over there one two three four five six seven eight in the middle you have the main symbol of the Sun God which is the circle with the cross in it remember I showed you the bull and I showed you the lion looking towards the circle with a cross in it that's the symbol of sun worship and in the middle you have the stella there it stands the symbol of Osiris transported from Egypt to this particular spot and the Pope had it moved to that spot and he commissioned or he put out a tender to move it and he commissioned that those who moved it to this spot should they let it fall and it should break all the workers would be put to death it took a long while to find someone who would actually do it but they finally did it and built it now the interesting thing about this is that you have this huge solar wheel and you have a wheel within a wheel there's the wheel within the bigger wheel now the throne of God in Ezekiel is described as a wheel within a wheel and here the throne of another deity is described as a wheel within a wheel we have today on this planet a real live representative of all the deities of Babylon in other words the vestments the title Pontifex Maximus can be traced all the way back as it came through history 
and it uh, today subsides in the papacy. I'm not condemning any Roman Catholic. Remember, I'm not talking about people. I'm talking about a system. The system represents it. And I believe there are many, many priests in Roman Catholicism who serve God to the best of their conscience and God acknowledges them as his children. I believe that. And I've met many, but when they hear the truth, they come out of her, my people. You cannot serve both Baal and the other one at the same time. You cannot serve good and evil at the same time. You cannot serve two masters. So there is a choice involved. Now if we know that this system represents not Jesus Christ, but represents the other light bearer, whose occultic name is Lucifer, then we must make a decision. And I'm telling you tonight, I believe, in fact, I, I know, I'm convinced, let's put it that way, that in the higher circles and in the inner movings of the secret societies within the system, they know exactly who they are worshipping. And I will prove it to you in future lectures. I'll put the quotes on the screen showing who the deity is that they worship by name. Then we have a king of Babylon today. If anyone bows down to him and accepts his authority over and above the authority of God, then you are bowing down to the system and you become subject to the king of Babylon. And that is something which we as Christians should not do. Because the Bible tells us, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins. I know that this is terrible information, but all I've done is I've shown you paganism, I've taken you to Babylon, and I've traced it through all the religions, and you find its greatest manifestation every single time within Catholicism. Down to the rod that he carries, with the pagan encrustations on it, he knows exactly what he's doing. They know exactly what they're doing, and where it comes from. But it's hidden under a garb of Christianity. And when you do that, you call it deception. Now I was a Roman Catholic, and when I saw these things, when I studied Daniel chapter 7, I was, I was shattered. I got sick. Because I was really a sincere Roman Catholic. I got sick. And I studied the scriptures and I went to the libraries to see if these things were so. And they were so. I studied the history and I said, there must be a way out. This cannot be. And it was so. And in the end I had no choice. And the more I looked, the more I studied, the more I saw. The more I saw that I was being duped into believing in another God. I remember sitting once in a Roman Catholic church and I was sitting there and I was saying every time I come to Mass, every time I go down on my knees, every time I go take the wafer and I feel so empty, please talk to me God, do you exist? And I sat in that church and I said, God if you exist, please reveal yourself to me and show me that you exist because I cannot understand the ritual anymore. I cannot have a relationship of ritual. I need a relationship of the heart. Tell me whether you exist. It was the most dangerous question I ever asked. Because it led me to the Bible. And it led me to show you what I show you tonight. I don't condemn any Roman Catholic. I was one myself. My whole family is Roman Catholic. And I love my family. And I don't want them to be lost. I don't want anyone to be lost. I'm not condemning. I'm revealing. Choose thee this day whom you will serve. Thank you. And come again to the next lectures. Please don't miss them. Thanks for coming.